Hope you enjoyed your lunch break and welcome back. Uh, Matt Cornilon will tell us how to create a board game chatbot with Postgres IE and track. Round of applause, please. Thank you, everyone. Uh, welcome. Welcome to the session. I know this is the end of the conference, the end of the week of the lunch, so you're probably tired and digesting. Uh, but don't worry, I promise uh, this session is going to be fun. It's going to be interesting. Uh, so bear with me. A uh, quick presentation from me. So my name is Matt. I'm a system engineer working for Google. Uh, outside work, I'm also a part of the organization of PGD France uh, and a regular speaker in the, the community, the Postgres community, especially. Um, maybe some of you were there uh, in Prague last year and uh, saw one of my talks. So I gave a talk about Postgres AI and one of my patients, Pokemon. And this year, I'm going I'm gonna to do the same. So I talk about Postgres AI and another of my patients, which is board games. So to give you a bit of context of why this talk, uh, I need to tell you that my wife actually is a board game shop owner. So every day, every week, she brings a new game to the home. And uh, what does that mean? That means new rules to learn. And one day after a particularly difficult day and difficult game, uh, I wanted to find something in a rule book and I couldn't. I just couldn't because I was tired and new. I knew something was there, but I couldn't find it. So I was like, okay, maybe I should ask help. And I was like, okay, let's ask Gemini. Gemini is the LLM from Google. You, you probably used it or maybe ChatGPT or something else. And I asked the question and I encountered a small problem. So uh, let me show you why there is a small problem in this process with two examples. The first one, I asked him a question about Monopoly. I guess everyone in the room knows Monopoly. So does Jimmy and I. So I ask him a very simple question. How do you get out of prison? And good for him, good for me. He answers with uh, the right answer. So he gives, he gives me the, the three ways to get out of jail in Monopoly. Easy. Next question is a little bit more uh, different, but still very simple. But this time it's on the brand new game, this one actually. And this time, unfortunately, Gemini is unable to give me the right answer. He says, unfortunately, I don't have access to the rule book of uh, Castle Combo. And if we look at uh, those two games, you can easily understand why Gemini is unable to uh, answer the, the question about Castle Combo. The fact is, Monopoly has been there for a while, actually 1935. I didn't know that when I wrote uh, the talk. And Castle Combo just has been released uh, last month. So it's very new. And if we look at uh, a chronology of uh, games, board games, and we put somewhere what we call the knowledge cutoff of Gemini, which is the date where uh, until when Gemini has been trained on, you can clearly see that we have a problem. Gemini has been trained on the data until late 2023. So for him, Castle Combo doesn't exist. It's something that hasn't been created at the moment, he's been trained. So obviously he cannot answer about uh, Castle Combo. So we have, we have three ways to solve this actually. The first, first way would be to use another LLM, an LLM that is maybe more up to date. Second option would be to fine tune a model with more up to date data or specific data. And the last option is uh, implementing retrieval augmented generation. So let's look at pros and cons of, of each solution. So, using a more up to date LLM for the pros, well, that's quite easy. Instead of going to Gemini and go to something else, Cloud or ChatGPT or something else. Um, but the cons of this is that maybe there's no up-to-date LLM, at least for the game I'm looking for, for the data I'm looking for, because we're talking about board games, but do you understand? You do understand that this is just one example. Um, the other problem of this is that maybe if I found something that is today up-to-date, maybe the next month I will have a question about something else, something that happened recently and something that the, the LLM doesn't know yet. So this will be continuously a new problem. So this solution cannot be implemented. Uh, the second solution is fine-tuning our own LLM or an existing LLM with update data or custom data. 
this is actually really good. This could be the best solution because the LLM would be trained on board game rules, so it would be perfectly uh, adapted to answering questions about board games and up-to-date board games. But the problem with that is that training an LLM is extremely expensive, expensive in time, expensive in money. So this cannot be done at all. So I cannot update the LLM with my data. Every single time I have a new board game, I cannot update the LLM. That's impossible. So the first solution is retrieval augmented generation. But let's pause a minute here. What is it exactly, RAG? I'm going to call it RAG because retrieval augmented generation is quite long and for French speaker, it's quite difficult. So let's look at a standard process of an LLM. So we have our user, which is which has a question, and this user will generate then a prompt. This prompt is then sent to Gemini. Based on this prompt, Gemini will then look in inside its own data. So it will understand the question, do some similar, similarity search inside its own data, and based on its knowledge, it will provide an answer to the user, which in our case is I don't know, because he has never heard about Castle Combo. So let's add a new player to this game, which is going to be Postgres. So we still have our user, which has still has the question because it's unanswered. And instead of sending the question directly to Gemini, what we're going to do is we're going to generate an embedding of the question. So an embedding is a vector representation of the data. Basically, instead of just looking at words and maybe creating a bitmap of words, we're going to capture the meaning of the data. And we're going to build out of it a vector representation. A vector is simply put a array of floats. So embedding can be generated on top of text, but also on audio, on pictures, on videos. So we have this uh, vector representing the question of the user, and we're going to compare it to other embedding that has been that will be stored on Postgres. So inside the Postgres, we will have a table full of board game rules, and for each of those rules, we also we have uh, an embedding. So we're going to compare the embedding of the question and the embedding of the rules, and out of this search, we're going to find the most uh, appropriate rules to answer the question. So based on this, we're going to build a new prompt. So the prompt is going to be a combination of the initial question and uh, the rules that we found on Postgres. So we're going to combine both, send those to Gemini, and Gemini will finally be able to give us the right answer because finally he had the data to build the answer. So let's go back on the pros and cons. Pros of this solution, well, flexibility. I've been talking about uh, board game rules, but obviously you can apply this to anything related to your business or your personal hobbies. So for example, you can build this on top of uh, custom messages on code base, on uh, anything that you already have in your Postgres data. This can be implemented ad hoc easy. Also, it's uh, it supports real-time updates because it's Postgres. Or every time I will insert a new data, it will be available for the rack chain completely. And lastly, it's easy to implement on existing and evolving data because the data is already there, so you don't have to do anything special outside building the embed. The cons, because I have to find one, would be that your data needs to be qualitative because if you want Gemini to be able to, well, find an answer, the data has to be there for him to understand and complete the answer. So we're going to build this uh, in the next uh, 30 minutes. And if we look at the big picture, so this is the rag chain completely, we're going to cover most of the points, uh, even though it's not always about Postgres, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to dig into uh, many of those topics because I think it's important to come to understand the, the big picture. So it's going to be a four-step plan. The first, the first step is going to be collecting the data, so collecting the rules and inserting those rules into Postgres. Uh, second one is going to be generating the embedding, so embedding of the rules and the questions. Uh, next, we're going to build, uh, we're going to do similarity search, so we're going to compare the embedding of the question and the rules. And lastly, we're going to talk about prompt engineering. I know this is a recurring joke, uh, joke on LinkedIn that prompt engineering is bullshit, but actually it's very important, especially in uh, RAG.
Okay, so collecting the data, if you are board game players, you probably know this website. This website is Board Game Geek. It's probably the most, uh, the biggest board game database in the world. It contains all the games, plus it has the PDF of every single uh, uh, board game rules. So I downloaded the PDF of the games I wanted to uh, work on, and the screen disappeared. He's back. So I downloaded the PDF, and the next step now is extracting the text from this PDF, splitting the text, and inserting into Postgres. So how are we going to do that? Well, we could do it with a simple Python library. So this is a few lines of Python. This actually works, and uh, this will be the result. So extracting uh, text from PDF, easy, that works. Uh, but the problem is, if you look closely at the result, you can see that, well, the data is mixed up. PDF are special. Um, uh, five. So it, it's always a little bit tricky to extract text because it doesn't understand the order of paragraph. It doesn't understand the text that are on top of images. So it's a lot of confusions. So what we could do is again use AI. We can use, for example, a, a model that is built uh, that has been built to actually understand document. So on Google Cloud, we have something called uh, Document AI that is able to take as an input a document and generate uh, the extract of everything. And this time, it works uh, perfectly because it has understand the structure of the PDF. It has understand that this is a title, this is a paragraph, this is the order, this is an image, and I been able to gather uh, the text on, on top of it extra. So very good. Now we need to split the text into chunks. So before before that, I need to explain why we need to split into chunks. Because in an ideal world, what we would do is actually take the full rule book of every single game, extract the text from the full uh, rule book, and put uh, the extract into a single row on Postgres. That would work. And then during the rag chain and the similarity search, once we found the rule book of the game, the question has been uh, asked on, we put everything to Gemini. This could work. The problem is the world is not perfect at the moment. For example, if we look at the embedding model that are generating the embedding of the text, we can see that we have a limitation of 2000 tokens. So a token is usually four characters. It's Token is, is, is something that is used by Gemini, by OpenAI, by Cloud. Every, every LLM are using this uh, methodology to split the words into uh, several characters to count tokens. Uh, and if we compare it to real English words, because depending on the language, this can be very different. And uh, we know that 100 token is usually 60 to 80 uh, English words. So you see where I'm coming, because if we look at a board game, uh, rule, for example, wingspan, it's already 12,000 token. So the 12,000 limitation, the, the 2,000 limitation to generate the embedding is going to be a problem. So we need to split the text. Another problem about this, about tokens, is that tokens is usually used to bill you when you are using LLM API or any embedding model uh, API, because the amount of token you're feeding the API is the amount of money you're going to have to pay. So we need to split and be uh, smart about it. What does that mean being smart? Well, the checking strategy is actually something that will uh, affect a lot two things, performance and accuracy of your results. So what I decided for this use case is not splitting by page, but splitting by paragraph. So every single title and the text in the below will be one row on my Postgres table. Okay, so now we have a table with the list of the games. For each game, we have the rules that are split into chunks. Now, what we need to do is generate the embedding. So to generate the embedding, we could call any single uh, embedding model on the market. So I'm going to, again, use Gemini, of course. So I'm taking the content of the rule, sending it to the API, and the API is returning with a vector. Surprise. The screen is gone. Suspense. I'm 
And we are back. So I was saying, we send the content of the rule to uh, um, an embedding model and the embedding model is giving us the vector. That's as simple as it is. And to store vectors, we have the chance to use Postgres and Postgres has an extension called PG Vector. PG Vector is an extension that will allow us to store vector, but also manipulate those vectors. So we get access to uh, a bunch of new data types. So for example, this vector one I'm using, but also new operators, new functions, and many of the stuff actually. So here, for example, I'm adding a new column in my table, uh, T-Rules. And uh, this column, I'm gonna use the vector data type and I'm specifying a number. This number is actually the number of dimension of the vector. The dimension of the vector is the number of float of the array, sorry. Uh, and the idea is the more dimension you have, the more precise the embedding is. But the problem with that is that more dimension you have, more floats you have, bigger your vector are, so more complexities to store and to put on memory, so trade-off. Okay, so now we have the rules and we know how to store and generate embedding. So uh, what we're gonna do is select all the rules from the, the rules tables, uh, call the embedding model, sending the rule and updating the table with the embedding. That's as simple as it is. It's a little bit uh, boring because we have to do scripting and Python and calling an API. Uh, this could be done a little bit simpler if you are using Google Cloud technology, for example, uh, Cloud SQL or RIDB, because we have another extension that is called Google ML integration that basically integrate with uh, Gemini and Vertex AI uh, uh, API. So instead of doing the Python script I showed, you can just simply use a function that is called embedding. You're providing uh, the machine learning model you want to use, the content, the, the, the data you want to calculate the embedding on, and it will return uh, the vector. So that's cool. All right, step two, done. We now have a table with all the games, with all the rules, and for each rule, we have the embedding. Step three, doing similarity search. So high level, what we're gonna do is take the input of the user, generate the embedding of the question, and compare it to all other embedding of the rules. But what does that mean, doing similarity search, actually? What does that mean, comparing two vectors? So if we look at some uh, CD example, for example, this page is, uh, let's say it has a vector of one and two, and this page has a vector of three and one. That's just example, of course. And let's add my question. So probably my question will have a vector of two and 0 0.5. So you, as human being, you can easily say that those two points are closer than those two points. Well, that's exactly what similarity search and a distance calculation with vectors is doing. So we know that this is the uh, uh, rule that is the most appropriate to the question. And on PG vector, I told you, you have access to new data type to store the embedding, but you also have access to new operators. So for example, I'm using this one. This is uh, the L2 distance operator. So it's enabling me to calculate the distance between the data that is stored in the embedding column and an input, so for example, this uh, small vector. And in this example, I'm going to keep the five best results, so the, the five ones that have the closest uh, distance with my input. But actually, on PG vector, you have access to six different operators to calculate the distance. So this is available since uh, version 0.7. Uh, before that, you only had access to L2 distance and cosine distance. Uh, the four two ones, the four new, the four new ones are new in zero point seven. Um, I won't go into details because we don't have time. But the idea between each of those is that depending on the use case, depending on the data, depending on the embedding model, you will prefer one method to, to the other. Usually, cosine distance would be, for example, really good if your vectors are normalized and if your vector have the same number of dimensions, for example. Okay, so for our example, we're gonna use the cosine distance with uh, this operator. Step four, prompt engineering. So I told you this is not a joke. So the idea in this uh, rack chain is coming from the user question, we're gonna build a new prompt that is 
enriched with the context, so basically the data that we've gathered. But we're going to do a little bit more than that. If you used LLM so far, so ChatGPT, Gemini, or Claude, or whatever, you probably experienced some bad stuff with LLM, because LLM can be wrong. They can say silly stuff. They can be convinced, convinced of silly stuff. You probably saw example of, of um, um, prompt where one plus one equals three, because that's what LLM can do sometimes. And the problem is that people are speaking to LLM as if they were resonating people. This is not the case. LLM are predicting answers. So we need to speak to them very carefully. So that's why I say most of the time when the LLM is wrong, this is because of us. So here are a few best practices that we can use when building prompts. So this is uh, obviously uh, good for reaction, but this is also good for daily learners. So, uh, Good to, good to know. First one, define the task clearly. That sounds like obvious, but if you want to have an analyze, say analyze. If you want a description, say description. If you want a summary, say summarize. It sounds silly, but it's important to be very clear. Uh, the next good thing is specifying the output. You want a list, say you want a list. You want a summary of one sentence, say you want a summary of one sentence, two sentences, three sentences, etc. Be very specific of the type of output you want. Next, something is something called few short learning. So this is something very important, especially in interaction, because this will uh, allow us to tell the LLM some example of what we want. So for, in our use case, for example, I would give him a set of question, board game question, some answers, and the way I want him to answer. So I'm going to give him real uh, examples. And I could do that one times, two times, three times, the amount of time I feel it's necessary for the LN to understand. Sure, just don't, don't just tell. That's what I've been telling so far. And personal and role playing. This is also very important because when we jump into the conversation with the LLM. He doesn't know. He doesn't know what he's supposed to do. So if you want to put him in a place of a chatbot for board game, say you are a board game chatbot. If you want him to be something else, say something else. It will help him to put in the context and then uh, provide accurate answers. So based on those best practices, we could come up with such framework for the prompt uh, engineering. So let's say, for example, the instruction. For the instruction, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell him, you are an assistant for question answering tasks specialized in board games. That's simple, that's context, that's personal. The other thing I'm going to specify is provide the extract from the rule book, because what I want is exactly this. I want him to answer, so provide an answer to my question, but I also want him to justify the answer by providing, copy-pasting the real board game rule because you found it on Postgres, so give it to me. Second thing, a few short examples. So I'm going to provide example of what I want. So in this case, I'm providing question, answer, and the way I want him to copy-past the uh, rule book. So here I'm saying, here are the corresponding rule. And I'm going to do that two times, three times, it's always a matter of experience. You're going to have to try. It's not, it's not a gold science, you know. Next, we're going to provide the context. So this is the data we've gathered from Postgres using the similarity search. So in our cases, this is uh, the chunks of the rules. And lastly, lastly, we're going to provide the real question. So the, que the question we want to answer. And if we combine all of this, this is an example of a prompt. So you can find the description of uh, the persona, the output desired, the desired outputs, uh, the context, so with the rules, uh, but also some example of how we want him it to uh, answer, and finally the question. All right, so uh, everything is ready. So let's let me show you a quick demo. 
So I build a UI. Uh, I hope you will be able to see it. We'll see. Um, I build a UI on top of everything we've been uh, showing and demonstrating so far. So it's it's simply it's simply a UI that is calling uh, uh, Gemini with uh, the prompt and Postgres and everything. So it's doing exactly what we've been uh, showcasing so far. So I've prepared a few questions. <clears throat> And let's try. So this is the question we've been talking about uh, since uh, the beginning of the talk. So in the board game Castle Combo, how many keys should we start with? It's a basic question. So you remember in the introduction, it, Jim and I couldn't answer the answer to the question. And this time he has been able to do it. So as you can see here, I hope you can see, uh, it gives me the answer in the board game castle combo. Each player should start with two keys. That's the correct answer. And a good thing is he followed me at my instruction. So here is the corresponding rule. And then he cop is copying pasting the uh, real uh, rule from the textbook. Uh, let's try with another game. So I'm trying more complex questions. It's still a very simple question if you uh, have access to the rule book, but still. Uh, the idea is for me to show you that even if I'm not using the exact same words from the rule book, uh, Gemini or the LLM uh, is able to understand the meaning of my question, finding the appropriate rule inside Postgres, and then build an answer on top of it. That's really cool. And last one for fun, because I think this is the most fun one. Uh, in the board game Pixies, how many points do you score per contiguous cards with the same color? This time, uh, so um, this one is a little bit tricky because uh, you saw I used the word contiguous. It's not a word that is used in the rule book. I checked, but still, he has been able to understand that I'm talking about cards that are sitting next to each, next, next to each other, and it's providing me the right answer. So four, four points, three, blah, 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 blah. I'm not reading the rule, but you get the you get the idea. All right, so it works. I showed you uh, now. Gemini is able to uh, answer me with data that is stored on Postgres, and in, it improves the overall thing because uh, now I can use LLM with up-to-date data or personal data or business data or private or whatever. But I think we can do better. So I have uh, four four things I want to talk about, but first we need to understand what do we need to improve actually. There are two things we can do here. We can improve the performance of the overall chatbot, so the amount of time is able to answer me. And the other thing we can improve is the accuracy of the answer. So I showed you some examples. Of course, those examples were good, but sometimes well, it might be wrong for some reason. So to improve the performance of the chatbot, we could uh, play on those three things. So first is the LLM inference time. So that's basically the capabilities of the LLM. I cannot improve Gemini, but uh, maybe this is something uh, some other people can do. But what we can do uh, as Postgres developers is maybe improve the Postgres query performance, so the one that is doing the similarity search, and uh, play with indexing, because so far we've not played with index. Uh, on the accuracy part, we can improve prompt engineering. So I showed you a template and an example that is working fine, but maybe you can do something else. You can uh, provide more example, you can uh, have a better description of what you want, you can improve many things. It's again uh, something you will have to uh, work on. We can change the embedding model. So I used one embedding model with uh, 700 uh, dimension, but if you want to be more precise, you can change the embedding model. If you want to be less precise but quicker, you can change the embedding model. Uh, you can use an embedding model that is specified on the language of your uh, contents. There are many things you can do with uh, the embedding model. And lastly, the chunking strategy. I told you uh, choosing a chunking strategy is actually very important because it will impact also the, the performance but the accuracy of the answer. Because if I'm providing a full page and not all the paragraphs are linked together, maybe Gemini will be confused. So we have to be careful with the chunking strategy. Today, we're gonna to focus only on those two because I'm cautious of time. But basically we could have had uh, a small 
discretion on all of those topics. Indexation. So, so far we've been doing what we call KNN, key nearest neighbor. Uh, the idea with KNN is that if I'm comparing an embedding with the other uh, contents, um, basically what Postgres is going to do is going to do a full sequential scan on my table. So it's going to compare the embedding of every single row of my table. This could be doable if you have a small amount of data, but if you have a large data set, this is going to be a problem at some point. But the good thing with this is because we are comparing with every single rule, every single row and rule, we're going to get the best answer. On the opposite, we can do something called ANN, approximate nearest neighbor. And the idea here is to use index. So index with vector search are a bit different than B-tree or other indexes you are already using with Postgres because it will not give you the best answer. It will give you an answer. It's a trade-off between performance and accuracy because it will have to make choice between on the way is building the index and giving you the answer. Maybe it will miss the right or the best answer. There are three different uh, methodology to uh, uh, use indexes with uh, PG vector. The, uh, the first two ones are IVF flat and HNSW that comes with PG vector, so you can use it uh, anywhere. And there's another one which is called scan, which is only available on AlloyDB. It's actually an implementation of Google search uh, algorithm. So uh, Google search, YouTube's ads, and etc. It's an uh, index that actually comes from there. I won't go into details today about this, but if you're interested, there's a, a very nice paper about it on how it has been built and deployed on Postgres. So IVF flat, just a few words about it. So IVF flat is usually uh, the choice you will choose for your index if you want to build something light and something quick. Uh, how does that work? We're going to build a map, uh, a cluster map of the vectors. We're going to so build some uh, group of all the vectors and build uh, find a centrum of all those clusters. And when we want to compare with other vectors, we're going to put this vector inside the map, just like this one. And based on this, we're going to find the cluster that are nearest to my vector. And using those clusters, I'm going to compare only the embedding. Uh, the vectors inside those two clusters. So this will be quicker, but maybe I will miss something. That's IVF flat, high level. Okay. Uh, HNSW, it's a little bit different. So it's, uh, it's um, an indexation that will work on layers. So what is it going to do? It's going to take all the vectors in your table. It's going to build a first layer, sorry, a first layer with uh, some sparse vectors. So for instance, very uh, large distance between the vectors. And it will build subsequent uh, layers. And each layer will add new vectors that are more closest to uh, the rest. And then it will navigate through these uh, layers. So it will start with an entry point, random. And then in this layer, it will try to find the vector that is the closest compared to the vector I'm looking for, which is on the bottom. So it's going to do that. And once it has found the closest inside this layer, it's going to do that in the second layer and third layer and et cetera, et cetera. You can customize the number of layer you are uh, uh, using. Obviously, the more layer you have, the more accurate your answer will be, but the longest your query uh, will be. Okay, so that was the indexation method. That's one method to improve the performance of your queries. Another good thing that we can now do with um, PG vector is quantization. That's not like a fancy word, but you'll see that's easy. Uh, quantization is a technique to reduce the size and the complexity of vectors. So basically, why, first, why do we need to do that? Uh, I told you, uh, if you are building embedding and vectors and indexes on a large amount of data, this could be soon a, a big problem for you, for your queries, because you will have to put your index into memory, but, but if it's too big, then you will have to uh, do the, the scan on disk. And well, with large data set problems. 
So if we reduce the size of the vectors, we will also reduce the size of the indexes. So that will be better for queries. And obviously, if we reduce the table and the index size, we speed up the searches. And also, another good thing is that we will be able to store more dimension of our vectors. So PG vector, uh, vector data type at the moment is limited and can only store up to 2,000 uh, dimension vectors. So this, is, this might be a problem if you want something very, very precise and you want to go higher. This is not possible unless you are doing quantization. So there are two methods of quantization. The first one is called scalar quantization and the other one, binary quantization. So the scalar quantization is uh, quite simple. The idea is to take uh, a float and instead of storing it on four bytes, we're gonna store it on two bytes. So we're gonna divide by two. What does that mean? That means we're gonna um, reduce the number of um, numbers we're keeping in our float. So you have an example here. Uh, so you have access to a new data type. So instead of using the vector, you're gonna use the half vec for half vector. And you can go up to 4K dimension vectors. Binary quantization is even more aggressive. So for each float, we're gonna replace it with a zero or a one. So that sounds like crazy because we're gonna lose a lot of precision. That's true. Uh, the good thing is you can go up to 64,000 dimension. That's a lot more than the vector type. So this type is called the bit type. So you can play with those types. You can also do quantization directly on the index. You can do both. You can mix. Uh, obviously, it's trade-offs. Um, so here is a small example of how am I... Sorry. I used to skip those usually. I'm gonna show it quickly. So it's a table with the three different data type. I'm inserting the same float into uh, those columns. And as you can see, the uh, float has been changed. So for the bit, it's a zero. For the vector, it's the standard float. And for the rest, it has been cut a little bit. Uh, the idea behind this is that, of course, we're going to gain something. We're going to gain space on disk, so we're going to gain space on memory. It's going to be easier to put the index in memory, so faster queries, etc., etc. Also, it's faster to build index. That's something important in um, uh, vector space. But the bad thing is, uh, of course, we're going to lose precision. And basically, the accuracy of our answer are going to be less good. We have less number, less precision, so obviously we might run into trouble. But there is one thing you can do to mitigate those. And this is the great thing about Postgres. This is hybrid search. Hybrid search is the idea of mixing semantic search, so what we've been doing so far, vector search, with something else. Something else could be full text search, but this could be also a geographical search or anything that is already available on Postgres. So for this example, I'm going to mix full text search and semantic search. The idea is to build two sub queries. The first, the first one doing full text search. So this is full text search queries, uh, uh, not the point of the, the talk, but uh, you can see I'm looking for the keys word inside the content of the rule. And the thing I'm going to do here is that I'm going to rank the result. So I'm going to take the 50 best result of, out of those rank, and I'm going to do the exact same thing with the semantic search. So it's another sub query. I'm doing uh, similarity search and I'm gonna keep the 50 best results. So the 50 have the, with the less distance uh, of my embedding. And then I'm gonna combine the result of those two uh, sub queries. I'm gonna build, uh, I'm gonna calculate a, a number based on, uh, based on the rank of the result. And this will give me so this methodology is called uh, reciprocal ranked fusion. The idea is just to give weight to the best result to uh, maybe uh, have more importance on uh, the similarity search or on the uh, semantic search, uh, the full text search, sorry. Uh, not the point of the talk, but you know that it's exists, so you can Google it. And the final result will be this. So it's a score that is cumulative accumulated by the full text search and the uh, semantic search. So we can combine the two scores and out of it, you will find the best answer. 
this is a recap of the step we just done. I recommend hardly to read that uh, excellent post of Jonathan Katz, uh, Katz which is um, a Postgres contributor that you, you might have seen in during the week. Uh, he has done some benchmark around uh, actually similarity search with quantization and mixed with hybrid search. And we can see that we do not lose accuracy and we gain performance by doing this. So really good. All right, few key takeaways before you go. Um, as, you, as we saw, vector search is a new powerful capability for Postgres. So we've talked about RAG, but actually you can apply this to many different things. The other good thing about a vector with Postgres is that it's not only a vector store. You can query the vectors, you can do index on top of the vectors, you can uh, apply quantization to the vector. You have many capabilities, not just a vector store. It can do many, many different things. The other good thing I want to highlight is prompt engineering. Prompt engineering is something very powerful in RAG, yes, but also in your daily life. So be sure to follow the uh, best practices. And lastly, what is something I, I used to say a lot, Postgres will always be there for you. That's the good thing with Postgres. It is improving all the time. PG Vector has seen a lot of improvement in the past year. Just the version 0.7 is so much improvement. Quantization, new operator, new dist distance uh, methodology, so many things. So it's improving all the time and you can already use it on your Postgres. If you already have data, you have access to semantic search with vectors. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. We have about eight minutes for questions, and I see we have an initiative for asking very good questions in form of board game. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, so I forgot please... to mention this. Uh, so um, I'm going to offer this game. So it's a castle combo game we've been talking about. Uh, to the question, to the first question, I cannot answer because of whatever reason. Uh, so the game is in French, but there's no text in it, and uh, it's actually out of stock in most of the board game shops, so it's going to be good. Yeah, you'll like it. The winner will like it. So... <laughs> Thank you. Is it going to rain tomorrow? Just kidding. I didn't get the question, sorry. Just kidding. I didn't hear it. No. Is it going to rain tomorrow? Is it going to rain tomorrow? No, what no exactly? that's not the question. Okay. Um, so you mentioned building the index um, so that the, the vector search will be faster. Um, should there be a consideration of building the index, index first while well, then the data set grows? Uh, or just the index can be built afterwards. Does the index block any operations um, once there is a lot of data? Not on the data, but yeah. So choosing the index you're going to use is always going to be something very specific. Specific on the use case, specific on the queries, specific on the data, but also specific on the embedding. So there are no golden rule. At the moment, you have access to different methodology, but I cannot say just use this. Something that is quite uh, agreed in the vector space at the moment is that HNSW is quite a standard for Postgres, but also for other vector stores. So I would go for it uh, at least first, but I would definitely try to uh, combine all of the uh, KPI we've saw to choose the index you want to use. Also with quantization, are you gonna use quantization? Because if that's the case, maybe, uh, you uh, you will uh, accept less accurate uh, um, uh, responses, but this will also have an impact on index. So it's a lot of things to to take into con consideration. Uh, do you know if work's being done to bring the scan index uh, also to PG Vector or open source it as a separate extension? Uh, at the moment, uh, I think in the research paper, there is some source code 
uh, but it's like a source code dump for like 12 years of research. So it's not really easy to read. Okay. Um, so at the moment, I don't know if it's planned to be open sourced or not. But the only thing I can say is that it's available at the moment on AlloyDB. And as you probably know, because you're working at Ivan, it's also available on AlloyDB Omni, which is the uh, version you can download and deploy anywhere outside Google Cloud. Um, but outside that, I don't know. Thank you for your speech. Um, I just have a question. If I correctly understand, uh, you split uh, uh, the PDF uh, in a different rank uh, based on a paragraph, uh, and uh, you put uh, inside the Postgres uh, different PDF or better different rank of a different PDF. Yeah. And do you put also some uh, metadata on a PDF? Because uh, except. Uh, 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 for me, it's quite strange uh, um, when uh, you write uh, um, a question, you get the correct response uh, um, because uh, the, the trunk uh, could uh, could have the name of the game or could <laughs> couldn't. So yes, that's a, an excellent question, and actually, I skipped some of my yes here. Uh, we have five minutes, okay? So. <clears throat> What I did is not exactly what I showed you. So um, instead of just calculating the embedding on uh, the rules, uh, I did something else because uh, the problem we have with questions usually like this one is that this question is gonna be very generic in terms of board games, for example. So for example, we have some bunch of useless words, but we have also some very common words. So we have the word points, we have the word dragon, which can be present in many different games. The very important one is actually Wormspan, which is the name of the board game. So as I was saying, dragon is everywhere in board games. So if I was asking this question with the actual model I showed you, it would probably didn't found the answer because there are many dragon games that are playing with points. So instead of just calculating the embedding of the rule, what I did is I calculated the embedding by concatenating the name of the game and the rule. But also I added the description of the game. So instead of just calculating an embedding on top of the rule, I mixed the name of the, of the game, the description of the game and uh, the content of the check. So it's improving the embedding. It's uh, uh, it's better for accuracy, definitely. So yes, I skipped it. I skipped it because I thought I wouldn't have the time to do it. We have question one or two more questions. By the time we can take. Well, I see no questions. Let's wrap it up then. Thank, Thank you very much. I think that.